Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Jay Jeremo about relationship building and the sharing of organizational objectives to drive higher productivity. Jay Germo, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Jonathan, thank you. Glad yeah, you I'm did. I'm excited to have this conversation with you today. We've been um, I'm I've been looking forward to this interview. We scheduled it out a ways, and and so we've been preparing for it. And uh, you know, with the holidays and just all the craziness of the beginning of the year, you know, this has been our first opportunity. Uh, but it's going to be a lot of fun to have a conversation. Um, you have an interesting background that I think will bring with it you know, an interesting context for the topic. Today, we're going to be exploring um, how sharing the sharing of organizational objectives between channel partners and vendors can minimize bottlenecks, uh, expand company output, and and the role of incentivizing third party teams for higher uh, productivity, and how that might balance or connect with traditional relationship building. And I know you, you've done a lot of work in, in those areas. As we get started, I just wanted to read Jay's bio and share that with everybody. Jay Jeremo's background began in cost accounting and asset valuation. He managed marketing analysis for national print advertising campaigns before moving into advertising production sales for Fortune 500 clientele like RR Donnelly, GM, Singular, Home Depot, and Korean Air. After a brief stint in options management for the Bank of New York. He started his own company making and distributing flavored and single pollen specialty honey. What started as a single person endeavor has grown into a network of honey production vendors that he distributes uh, for and with direct to customers outside to traditional retail channels. Uh, Super fascinating um, kind of trajectory and background and i look forward to hearing more about your current business but also how it i get that with, a lot yeah with with the topics of of these channels um pro- productivity and just making sure that you're putting the right incentives in place to to make sure everything runs smoothly and effectively um anything else you'd like to share by way of personal background sure. or context before we really dive into the conversation um I don't know. Actually, while you were talking, not so much that I, I want to add so much as um, I realized a couple of things about my own um, uh, my own company as as it relates to my background. Um, when I was in sales for uh, the print companies, um, I originally took those roles because I thought they were going to be, um, you know, sell a project and move on to the next one, but very quickly learned that I would have to shepherd the, making sure the print was done properly. And that kind of leapfrogged itself into um, how I manage my, my company now. Yeah, excellent. Well, so I appreciate that context. And um, as we really get started, perhaps you can share a little bit with us more specifically about your current company, um, how you kind of got into that business, because it's unique. Um, and then we can really connect that with, with the broader topic for today. Sure. Um, actually I was, um, I was one of the human capital fallout, um, of 2008 when everything went, uh, when we had the big financial crisis, I lived in, uh, Chicago and I lost a lot of net worth. Michigan ended up work after about a year, I was on vacation and stopped off at a cousin's house. Um, and I should say, bef- you know, before we go any further, I had always had, um, aspirations to have my own company, but I really didn't know what to offer to market. And just in visiting with this cousin, uh, he had just gotten married not too many years 
previously. And he and his wife had started making uh, flavored honey. He was a beekeeper. And he mentioned to me on the side that, you know, if you wanted to, you could, somebody could probably take this down to uh, the Detroit area and do okay with it. And I thought about that for like three weeks and uh, long story short, took him up on his offer and I couldn't keep up with the demand. Um, that, that's basically the long and short of it. And then, um, you know, you, you follow the money. Um, I'm not going to, uh, you know, I have no interest in being like a, a one hit wonder for one weekend. So I just kept selling over and over and over and picked up more markets and it kind of grew from there. That you can see that kind of just organic growth um, and, and have that level of success. So as, as you're starting this new business, you've taken on this opportunity. What were some of the earliest like pain points that you experienced? You, are, you already mentioned you couldn't keep up with demand. So, so how did you start to deal with that? And how did you start to leverage um, you know, some of the, the distribution channels and bring on people to your team to, to, to respond? Well, I was never really, um, I was very apprehensive about having employees, but the idea of channel partners was a lot more uh, interesting. I still like to have a lot of control over um, the production aspect. So I knew I was going to need to have more hives and I don't mind getting my hands dirty with that. So I would acquire more hives, uh, either, um, uh, brand new buys or um, beekeepers that were closing up and would offer boxes um, online. I would just sort of kind of piece together um, um, my plots, uh, but I wanted to be very involved with that. And then if I was going to utilize outside help, I would uh, I'd go to larger beekeepers and say, hey, I'll give you um, um, you know, I'll give you a lease on a portion of your hives if I can pick the locations. Um, I still want to be involved with production, but you know, if, if your guys can check on them every now and again, um, that would be helpful. So it was, it was kind of a, it was kind of a way to just meet in the middle and not have my own direct employees, but attach other people um, to my production output by incentivizing, um, by incentivizing them uh, to be involved with the lease. So I, I kind of made my model up as I went. Yeah, and that's an interesting model. Um, like you said, you were you were apprehensive about bringing on uh, employees and having kind of that overhead and that those fixed costs. Um, so going the channel route you know, was, was kind of a hybrid approach, I suppose, you know, and, and making sure that you had the labor to get things done, but maybe you can talk more about how you, um, what did you do to incentivize channel partners and, and how did you balance that? Um, you know, where, where, you know, you're, you're trying to make it a win-win scenario for everybody. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership, Ordinary Everyday Actions That Produce Extraordinary Results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data-driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership 
will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. It started being a, um, um, the model that I had just referred to, but then I, I quickly figured out that incentivization, I guess the best way to say this is it's almost like you try to incentivize people, or this has been my experience. When you try to incentivize people, they may agree to it initially, but it's almost like give them enough time, they'll forget about the incentivization. Um, and ultimately what ends up working is just organically and just naturally you develop a relationship with the people you're working with. So for example, the person who I get um, all of my hives from and all of my, uh, or even uh, the bottling aspect, I didn't necessarily get the best prices when I started buying uh, my own bottles, but over a period of years, um, as my volumes increase, you have more and more conversations with uh, your vendors and you develop, I guess, for lack of a better word, a uh, kinship. I mean, it's not, it's not really rocket science. It's just over, over time, people start to understand you. They start to understand your needs and your demands and they can watch it grow, especially if they're supplying to you. Um, and then you just naturally take uh, the benefits of that relationship, but it's not, and I don't want to, you know, kind of dump on younger people, but there's no real quick answers to um, how to get the most out of people. Really what it comes down to, and I feel like I'm going to sound like an old man saying this, but um, you just have to be genuine and be direct, pay your bills on time. Um, and there's real, there's a real truth to cultivating a um, reputation because if you're a dependable person, it's, it's more powerful than, than the internet. It gets around. And the same is true as if, you know, you don't pay your bills on time and you're uh, not dependable. You're not, you know, if you're selling a product and you're not at a, a particular venue uh, regularly, that, that will start to show. So uh, I hope that answers your question. It really, yeah. it really was kind of a labor of love that just grew into, I spent enough time with people. And then um, I think ultimately what happens is I, just to give you a little insight as to my business, I try to practice uh, just in time inventory. So I don't order more bottles until I am at the razor's edge of being out of them. So once I am, now that I have developed this relationship with my um, plastics and my glass people, I can call them up and say, okay, I'm going to have enough for like another 12 days. And then that's, that's it. And now, not so much, you know, four years ago, but now I can call them up and they, you know, even if they are out of inventory, they can piece together what I need because they understand uh, my volume usage and they, they also track it as well. So they, they know what to expect and when to expect it. Yeah. I, uh, there's a lot you said there that I think is really important. Um, you know, from, in, I in run on at the mouth and I apologize. For no, that. no, so no, 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 no. That, that's really good. And I just wanted to highlight, you know, the, the importance of relationship building, as you were mentioning, um, you know, you're answering the question, how do you incentivize? And, I think, you know, what you were saying is actually backed up by a lot of research, uh, for example. So like long-term sustainable um, relationship building uh, is not easy, like the benefits of that is not easily replicated um, by other approaches. And there's lots of research that shows that incentivizing people for performance through, you know, various monetary incentives it simply doesn't have a, a, a big long-term effect. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, people kind of, they get used to it. They just kind of start even thinking about it. They forget about it. Um, now everyone wants to be taken care of. Everyone wants to be treated fairly, equitably. Um, nobody wants to be taken advantage of. 
But assuming you don't do any of those things, you know, and that's kind of a low bar. At that point, you just make sure you do enough to take care of people and treating them fairly. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the monetary incentives don't actually do a whole lot to drive further productivity and motivation and those sorts of things. Um, what really does is when you have a long-term sustainable business relationship established with these people where they know that they can count on you. Um, they know that you're a dependable customer, you're a dependable partner um, and vice versa, right? And as that relationship is established, then you can start to really fine tune, like you were talking about your just in time inventory. Like that's something you can't do unless you have these relationships um, as, that are firmly established where you have a reputation. Um, and when that's all in place, then it can lead to uh, really good outcomes. And But there's no real shortcut for it because relationships don't develop like that. They only develop over time as you are consistently putting in the effort as you consistently live up, you know, like you build your reputation, you demonstrate that you're a person in a business that values integrity um, and that you're reliable. And as all of that is in place, then you, over time, you, you uh, kind of build out the scaffolding to support the kind of growth that you're talking about. Yeah. And it's like, um, I would have to say that, I, I don't want to say that growth isn't a problem, but you, I have a deeper appreciation for it now than I did when I was working in a, when I was an employee for an, for an organization. Like when we sold, when I sold print, a salesperson was just kind of at the, I don't wanna say the bottom of the totem pole, but he was far enough down that capacity wasn't a concern of mine or it wasn't supposed to be. So I could sell three large jobs in a row that operated back to back to back. And I would hear my managers complaining about how are we going to get press time for this? And how are we going to get cut time for this? And like, you know, these things are happening all at the same time. We're going to have to outsource. And I really didn't care about any of that as long as my projects were delivered on time. And now I'm at a point where I just can't do everything by myself. And this is really low season for me. So when high season kicks into gear, I have to start looking at, you know, do I want um, bottling equipment or do I want, you know, some, some I'll always do myself, but um, for some of the larger, like the internet orders, as I get to a place where I have to fulfill, you know, every day, um, I'll have to go to somebody else to say, look, you got to manage production for me because I need, because I, I do a lot of different flavors. We do like 20 different flavors plus regulars, plus a thick honey that has to be done by hand. And I can't fit, I can't fit it all in. So um, what will happen with that eventually will be the same transition that happened with buying two boxes of um, eight ounce bottles and two boxes of, 12 ounce bottles. I'll start off. All right. I just want you to do this one product. Make sure you do it right. We're going to work out the bugs and then we're going to go to another one and then do another one. And then I think, it, I think that's how the growth happens for me. Um, I listen to a lot of uh, um, business podcasts and entrepreneurial conversations and entrepreneurial podcasts. And they, you'd make it, you'd make, you wouldn't be faulted for assuming that these guys just snap their fingers that, you know, guys who have a, a $40 million bankroll who can say, all right, call up this person, this person, this person, we're going to have all of our units pushed over to them and manufactured and out the door in three weeks. Well, they have teams of people. I don't have teams of people. It's just me. So you have to, um, as a solo entrepreneur, all of those, you have to, I hate using buzzwords, but you really have to understand big picture. And I had no appreciation for it when I was in my 20s. I heard it a lot, but it didn't make any sense. Now I'm like, all right, what would, what would my boss have done? Well, he would have gone to X, Y, and Z vendor, had a conversation, say, how can we make this, you know, how, how, how can this happen? Um, and 
really you just start running scenarios in your head and then out loud and then you start having conversations with people and that's what i mean about organic that's how the progression happens but i like i'm not a big fan of there's so many internet models and apps on there on, on how to grow and i'm like you can follow a map or a digital product that somebody makes for how to scale your business but if you don't fundamentally understand progression those things don't work in, in my mind yeah yeah there's there's no silver bullet there's no recipe you know for success every every business every market is a little bit different and it's all about relationship building and connecting with the channels and the vendors and just making sure that uh, like you said I, I'm a big believer in organic growth um, I, I think sustainable organic growth is 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 a good way to go so Jay it has been a real pleasure talking with you I know Thank we're you. about out of time before we close though I just wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you find out more about your business and what you're up to and anything else you want to share uh, by way of last word uh, well, uh, Jonathan, thank you very much for uh, giving me the venue. I really appreciate it. Um, the name of the shop is Hey Honey, and you can find us at heyhoney.biz. That's H-E-Y honey.biz. Um, Instagram at uh, J-A-Y Hey Honey. Um, and um, yeah, that's about it. We write, a, you know, I, I do a blog on traveling and uh, making food with honey from around the world. Um, yeah, that's about it. That's all I got for you. Excellent. Well, thank you, Jay. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, try out Jay's honey. Uh, uh, I, I love a good uh, a good organic honey and uh, it's it's a wonderful product. Um, sounds like some some good insights that uh, that you can learn from Jay and in, in, as he's grown his business as a solopreneur. Uh, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. We are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.